Run. Okay. Okay. Since when did you wish to make that film? Uh, actually, it was like really funny because I've been wanting to make films for like a long time, but uh, this one happened very, very quickly. Uh, I um, uh, I got the idea um, about uh, it's about two years ago now. I got the idea about two years ago, and I wrote it in four weeks. And we literally got the money to make it, you know, allowed to make it in about like, like about three months after that. So it's just like boom, you know. I, I, I've talked to Tim Robbins here and John Turturro. They've had this, they had their films for like five, ten years in their mind and whatever. Uh, this one just like this one just just uh, after all the movies before I tried to make that like never happened and took years and never happened. This one happened just really quickly. Uh three months, but before or after Harvey Keitel uh, was in the project? Uh, no, no, Harvey Keitel was in the project almost right from uh, the beginning after the script was, re uh, after, after the script was written. Uh, it was like about like, um, um, uh, Harvey, Harvey got involved in the project because uh, his acting teacher, who was, a, who was uh, um, the producer, was a friend of theirs, gave her the script to give to Harvey. She read it. She liked it. She gave it to Harvey, and like literally, like a couple days afterwards, Harvey called up. Harvey, Harvey called me up on the phone and said, "I love this film. I want to be involved in it. Let's make it." But uh, involved in it uh, as an actor. As but, a, and then he, he became the producer of the film. How he became the producer is um, uh, when we started casting, we didn't have any money, and Harvey was like knocking himself out, making himself available to us. He was involved in the casting process and everything. And what he did was, he said, "Look." We should go to New York because we hadn't didn't have any money. We were based out of Los Angeles, and we said, you know, you know I was like, you know, broke, and the producer was broke, no, no money. And they said, uh, we should go to New York and have some casting sessions. And finally, he just said, look, I'm gonna pay for us to go to New York. I'm, I'm, I'm gonna, I'm gonna send you guys out there with me. Where I'm gonna put you up in a hotel, and we're gonna have, a, and I'm gonna arrange it all, and we're gonna have, uh, you know, a weekend of New York casting. And it was like, once he did that, it, it was like, okay, Harvey, you got to be one of the producers. <laughs> Um, which Harvey said, it's about time. I was wondering when you were going to figure it out. What took you so long? <laughs> and what about Monty Hellman? Monty Hellman got the script. Um, he got it mistakenly. The, he had thought that uh, uh, it was available to direct. And he, uh, through a mutual friend again, he read it and uh, uh, wanted to do it. And he wanted to have a meeting with me. And you know, I knew I wasn't going to give it up, but I couldn't resist having a meeting with Monty Hellman. He's one of my favorite directors. So uh, I got together with him and we were having ice cream on, on, on Hollywood Boulevard, you know, in this uh, little ice cream shop. And so we're eating and, and he's saying, look, I can get the movie made for you, but only if I direct. And I said, well, you know, uh, as much of an honor as it would be, this one's mine. And so like that was that. And okay, so we're, we're finished eating our ice cream and as we're finishing it, finishing it up, he goes, well, tell me, how are you, you going to make the movie? So I'm like explaining to him how I, would, how I was going to make it, and uh, you know, by the time we finished ice cream, he goes, I think you're going to make a really good movie. How about if I executive produced? And I said, deal. <laughs> uh, the influences of uh, the killing is evident, but uh, are there other influences? Yeah, you know a film that actually um, is a, a big influence on, uh, on, on, uh, on the film is John Carpenter's remake of The Thing. It's very similar, all right. And I, mean, I didn't do anything, to, like take anything from it, but I wanted to capture that same feeling. In the thing, in the thing, you have um, all these guys trapped in this room, all right, and no one can trust anybody else, and they can't go anywhere else, and they just have to deal with each other, which is exactly the exact same situation in Reservoir Dogs. And what I wanted to achieve is what I felt that film achieved when I first saw it at the theaters was the tension of those guys in that situation was so great and there was no release of it because they were it was so claustrophobic that it just the only place that, that tension could go was right out into the audience and that's how I felt when I was looking at the thing and that's what I wanted to achieve in my movie other other influences were are you know just different novels and uh, the the the, the uh, French new wave film uh, the French gangster films of Jean Pri Melville gigantic influence. I can't tell you how much. His films are fantastic. And he's the reason that the guys have color names. Because I just thought it was just that special French tough guy existentialism that he did so well. I could see Alain Delon, you know, saying, I'm Mr. Blown, you know. So. You are an actor also. Mm -hmm. uh, do you consider yourself as an actor who wanted to be a director or a director who eventually 
uh, is an actor? No, I, I started out as an actor, and and uh, uh, that was like so I've never went to film school. That's like that's my training. My only training is like uh, going to acting schools. Um, uh, but it was just eventually at a certain point I realized I didn't just want to be in movies. I wanted to make movies. I I, I came to the I came to the realization that I, uh, that I am a filmmaker, and I, I act pretty good. But uh, but what I really want to do is make movies. How did you work with the actors? Uh, I imagine uh, each actor is different from. Well, uh, the other. That, so. that's, 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 that was, that was, a, that's a tricky part about doing like an ensemble piece like this because you put together six actors. Not only are you dealing with six different personalities, you're dealing with six different ways of working, and you're dealing with six different acting styles. You know, uh, you know, one guy needs a lot of rehearsal. Another guy doesn't like any rehearsal at all. One guy's naturalistic. One's, one guy's method. You know, um, um, so you know, that's tricky. How I did it, I'm not exact. I don't remember uh, necessarily, other than just you deal with each of them as individuals. Some directors will like say, "This is my way of working with actors," and boom, and everyone has to adjust to him. And I think that's just ego, because you want the actor to uh, uh, deliver, you know, deliver you the best he has. And if he has a special way of working, then you have to make things work for him. All right, and understand that. All right, because you want everyone to be their best, and so. You, you work with it. The thing that I had going on my side was, as an actor, I understood that. All right, I understand the process. I'm not baffled by it. All right, I understand what it takes for Harvey to do what Harvey needs to do. It's completely understandable. Also, the other thing that I had on my side was there, there was no ego. Everybody was there to make the best movie they possibly could. Everyone cared about the film. All right, there was no ego involved. You know, only, only, only love. And even Harvey Keitel listens uh, entirely to his director? Extremely. I mean, put it like this, is like uh, in the rehearsal process, we had two weeks of, of straight rehearsal before the, film, before, before the film went on. All right, during the rehearsal, right, Harvey doesn't like, and he's right not to, all right, he doesn't like anything predetermined because the rehearsal is, is discovery. It's a journey, all right? You know, it's, it's, you, know, um, you know, if I say, Harvey, I want you to walk through the door angry, all right. Well, that's it. The discovery's over. He knows what I want. All right, and uh, and that's what he's going to give me, and that's what he's going to give me because he wants to please me. All right. But if I say, Harvey, just walk through the door and let's see what happens. All right. Then he can walk through the door and do whatever he wants, and and like it could be something I never thought of. It, I can always say, I can always make the adjustment. I can always say, okay, now Harvey, I want you to do it angry. I can always do that, but you can never limit your possibilities of what the actors can bring to you fresh. It's easy, it's, it's easy enough to tell them what you want, but let them show you, you know, uh, what you, you know, what was never in your head first. What about those songs? Uh, the choice of those songs of the 70s. Well, you know, that's the, that's, the, that's the music I grew up listening to, and and I thought it was like just, uh, I thought they were a neat uh, counterbalance, all right, to the, the the rudeness and 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 the roughness in the movie. It it, it, it makes the movie easier to watch. By having this, like you know, you know, this like completely inappropriate music <laughs> playing during the course of this, like you know, rough, rude, tough, violent movie, it takes the sting off it a little bit, did but not, you, not, not not a lot, just just a touch. Did you like us uh, know the, those songs were going to to be uh, heard in the soundtrack? Uh, one song I wrote, uh, "Stuck in the Middle with You," to be in the movie, uh, and. Um, uh, it was like by hook or by crook we were going to get that. You see, the, the problem in uh, in America, I'm sure probably all over the world, when you make a movie is is you know the, the business of putting songs in movies has become big, big, big business. You know, it's not like the days of Easy Rider where you know, De De Dennis Hopper can call up uh, Roger McGuinn from the Birds and like they give him a song, or in Monty Hellman's case where he has uh, uh, Laurie Bird and Tulane Blacktop just sing a cappella, uh, uh, can't get no satisfaction. That would be that would be a hundred thousand dollars now, or maybe three hundred thousand dollars now. When in that he did for nothing. Um, and so, like, when you're making a low-budget movie like my film, um, he, he, the problem, you know, the problem is you can't afford to do this. But I said, look, we're going to do it. We're going to figure it out. No, we can't afford to pay a lot of money. We're just going to have to get them cheap. But we can't say n can't say can't. We have to figure it out. We're just going to have to figure out a way. And we did. We had a wonderful music supervisor, and we got them all. Great. Thank you very much. Thank you. I liked your film very much. Oh, thank you very much. Did you see it last night or this last afternoon? Night. Oh, cool. Good deal.